All right. So, um, yeah, like I said, I've been, I kind of gotten used to it. It was kind of weird in the beginning, sitting in front of a camera in an empty room. And, but when they said we could meet live again, we thought, why not? A lot of churches are not meeting live again. Pardon the tape and all of that. We're complying with the governor's orders. So that's why the chair, the rows are taped off, etc. Um, I've been talking about Isaiah 55, verse 9 through 11, and Isaiah 55. And we've been talking about, on the videos I've been doing on YouTube, uh, renewing our mind or changing the way we think. Repentance is the Greek word. It means metanoia, change of mind or change of thinking. And we've been talking about the need that you can't get into the kingdom of God if you don't change your way of thinking. And in Isaiah 55 verse 9, if we uh, have that, um, in Isaiah 55 9 he said, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. God was talking to us and he said, listen, my thoughts are higher, as high as the heaven is above the earth. Now, we go up, you know, it's a distance. He's not saying there's a distance between his thoughts and our thoughts. How, how far, we were out, they've started building our house out in, in uh, Powhatan. And Carol and I went out yesterday. They dug the footings and they were pouring the footings. And Carolyn said, it looks so small. And I love what our builder said. He said, because you're comparing it to infinity. He said, you got infinity up above you. He said, you're comparing the footprint of your house to infinity. See, when he's talking about the earth, he said, your thoughts are earthy. They're limited. My thoughts are infinity, the, as high as the heavens. Because think about the heavens. If you started going up, 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 when would you quit going up? Never. You could just keep going up, keep going. It's infinite at the heaven level. It's finite at the earth level. He said, just as there's an infinite difference between your way of thinking and my way of thinking, so there's an infinite difference between, or there's an infinite difference between heaven and earth, so there's an infinite difference between how I think and how you think. But then we pointed out in verse 10, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it barren sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. He said, it will accomplish what I send it to and be prosperous in the thing that where unto I sent it. And here's what, here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, my thoughts are infinitely higher than your thoughts, but there's a way to bridge that gap. There's a way to close that distance. And he said, that is, my word works just like rain. He said, you have this dirt. In that dirt is seed. And he said, the rain comes down and causes the seed to grow up. He said, so my word accomplishes the same thing. It comes down from heaven and it will begin to elevate your thoughts up closer to my thoughts. Listen, we're never going to get to God's thoughts completely because he's infinite and we are not. We can never, figure of speech, catch up. He's been there forever. We have not been here forever. We will be here on the other side of forever but he's been on both sides of forever and will always be. So we're never going to get to his thoughts. He's not saying you can be exactly like me because we can't. But we can forever be getting closer and closer and closer to his way of thinking. And so um, he said, listen, my word is the thing that will elevate you. So let's go to Luke chapter 10. Luke 10. Carolyn preached on this a few months ago and I thought it was beneficial to come back around to it. Luke chapter 10 verse 38 Luke 10 38 and it came to pass as they went they Jesus and his disciples he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received them into her house verse 39 she had a sister called Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Now let me stop there. That's what everybody thinks that says. Sat at Jesus' feet. And I've heard tons of preaching on, well Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And we just have to sit at the feet of the Master. No, Mary sat at Jesus' feet and did something. What was Mary doing at Jesus' feet? Listening to His Word. Heard 
his word. She's sitting at his feet hearing his word. Martha was distracted with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her therefore to help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, <laughs> you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now again, I've heard people teach on that. That he's saying, well, sitting at the feet of Jesus. All right, so right now, all of y'all, let's sit at the feet of Jesus. Let's just do it. Where are they? Where can, well, it's in the spirit. Okay, let's all in the spirit sit at the feet of Jesus right now. Let's, how many are ready? Ready? How do, how do we do that? How do we in the spirit sit at the feet of Jesus? Mm, we'll, uh, we'll imagine. We'll imagine Jesus' feet. And we'll sit there. Listen, not very practical advice. If that's the advice... The one thing that's necessary it is to sit at his feet. We could have a million different ideas of how to do that. How do I sit at the feet of Jesus? But Mary wasn't just sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus hearing his word. He said that's the one thing that's needful. How do I know that's the one thing that's needful? Because didn't he say in another place, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth out of the mouth of God. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. Sitting there with Mary. The word of God is coming out of his mouth. And he, she, he said the one thing. She's picked the one thing that's important. Here's the reality. What Jesus was saying. Now we don't. Let's be honest. How many of y'all believe this? One thing is needful. We believe it intellectual. Intellectually. He didn't say one of the things that's needful. He said really only, in fact, he said, you, verse 42, one thing is needful. Mary has chosen that good part. He literally says the only thing you need is the word of God. See, you think, and I think, well, I need money to pay my bills. You think, and I think, well, I need healing. You think, and I think, well, I need some help with my children or I need a new car or you and I think lots of things are needful and Jesus said no 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 only one thing is needful which is listening hearing the word of God Martha is serving we all agree serving God's important do we all agree serving God's important Martha is serving God but he doesn't list that as the the needful thing see one of the problems with religion is religion kind of teaches us to serve. Religion hammers the service side of things. But Jesus didn't say the one thing you better do is serve God. He said the one thing you better figure out is sit and hear the word of God. It is the problem in the, in the Christian community as far as I am concerned. I am amazed at the lack of word knowledge of so-called Bible believing Christians. I mean, over the years, I've been appalled at the, the sheer ignorance of Christians that have been in church 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. But you know, one of the things I've noticed over the years, I'll get up to preach, and I'll notice people whip out their phones. Now, I am not so stupid as to believe they all got Bible apps. Because if you have a Bible app, why are you doing this? You're, you're texting somebody, you know, you're writing an email. You're, they, they come to church... And don't come to hear the word of God. And for most Christians, this is it, brother. This is all they get. It's whatever they get on a Saturday night or Sunday morning. They, and, and even there, they're half paying attention. I, I remember years ago, uh, we were at church one Sunday back before we were pastoring. We were, we were just attending church. And Karen had gone to the ladies' room. And she comes back, she goes, you wouldn't believe the hallway. I said, what do you mean? She goes, half the church is in the foyer. So I'm like, oh, I got it. So I got up to go to the back. I didn't have to go, but I wanted to see. Well, I realized everybody had slipped out, man. They didn't want to, they wanted to be out in the foyer talking. And so in ex half is maybe an exaggeration, obviously an exaggeration. But tons of people were out there yak, yak, yakking. Listen, churches have no problem. A big church has no problem finding guys that have worked the parking lot ministry. Why? It, there's never a shortage of guys that want to park cars. You ever notice the parking cars never ends? 
the guys that want to play, this isn't meant as judgment, but, you know, I've noticed, you know, service starts at 10. At 1040, they're still out there just in case, because what are they doing? Talking. I, I'm going to pick on our, what used to be our head usher back when we were a big traditional church. Our head usher, one of the reasons he liked being our head usher, and I won't identify him, but, uh, because he could stand in the back and talk. You know, you, we come to church and we want to talk. Let's, do we, yeah, okay, get it over with. Now, I'm, let, let's back up to a previous message. I realize in a lot of places they're preaching nothing. And so, okay, I will excuse people. If, you go, if you're going somewhere where people are preaching nothing, you know, because there are preachers, I don't know if you know this, but there are preachers that can preach nothing really fast. And there are preachers that can preach nothing really slow. And there are preachers that can preach nothing dramatically. But they're preaching nothing. So I'm not talking about that. If, you, if you're going to a church where the preacher's preaching nothing, run away. We should all be going to a church where the word of God is coming forth. Not psychology, not feel good messages, not self help messages. The word of God. And if the word of God is going forth, what are we doing? And I'm not picking because y'all don't hang out in the foyer. I'm just saying my observation over 30 years of serving God is how many Christians there's no place in their life for the word of God. Jesus said unless you repent, unless you change how you think, you're not going to be able to get into the kingdom of God. You're never going to be able to function in a kingdom that's so different, that's infinitely higher than the place that you live. He said the only way you're ever going to elevate up into that kingdom is to let that word come down into your mind, into your heart, and begin to transform you. That's why it tells you in Romans 12, too, I think. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. How do you renew your mind? With the Word of God. He told Martha, he said, listen, you're busy serving me, but Mary's picked the most important part. Because here's the reality. You could be dropped in the middle of the Sahara Desert with only one thing. You get to pick one thing. We actually did a game years ago. We were playing a, we had a, we went on a church like weekend uh, cruise together. They used to have this river cruise up on the, on the James and, and we played the Trulywed game. And you yeah, remember the Newlywed game? We took four couples in the church that had been married for a while and we played the Trulywed game as part of our evening's activities. And one of the questions was if you were going to be alone on a desert island and could only have one thing, what would it be? I'll never forget one lady's answer. It's the only answer I remember. Lipstick. And her husband guessed correctly. <laughs> Lipstick. Listen, what Jesus is telling Mary, if they parachute you in the middle of the Sahara Desert, don't say, and they say, well, you can have one thing. Well, let me have a jug of water. That water is going to run out. He told Mary, he said, there's really only one thing you need. If you have this book, technically, you have everything you need. Because can you get water from this book? Is it possible in a desert, through the word of the Lord, to get water? Yes, it is. I don't know if it's possible to get lipstick. But it is definitely possible to get water through the word of the Lord. And, but... How many Christians, born again, claim to be Bible-believing Christians, the Bible is not first place in their life. See, metanoia, uh, we pointed this out on one of the videos I made, Jesus preached the word of God. He didn't just say, go renew, how, change how you think, have at it. He preached the word to them because that's how they could change the way that they think, was the word of God itself. We are, we are woefully short of the amount of word that we get. I mean, Carol and I listen to usually a, a, at least a sermon a day, and I feel malnourished frequently. I mean, I, I, sometimes a sermon a day, in fact, frequently a sermon a day, I feel malnourished. We're watching sermons on YouTube. We're listening to sermons in the car. It's man does not live by bread alone. He lives by the word of God. And we know from Romans 10, faith is energized by the preached word of God. Faith is energized. It says faith. Remember we pointed out a few, several weeks ago where it says faith comes by hearing. That word comes was added by the translators. It literally says we faith by the word of God. 
This is how we do everything. That's what he was telling Mary. And yet most of the Christians I know. This is not the final authority in their life. This is not the end all of all discussion. And you know for believers it should be. For born again believers. God said it. The end. My dad said. Whatever he said. And one of the reasons we're not receiving any more than we are. Is because most of us and most of the Christians I know don't have that mindset. We're, um, you know the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Now, all of us agree we would never do that, right? Would all of us agree I would never do that? The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Well, everybody in this room, we're not going to say there is no God. Maybe. Here's how it works in real life. In real life, a lot of people don't go, there is no God. But, for example, God says, if you don't work, what? You shouldn't eat. How many Christians right now don't want to go to work because the unemployment benefits are better than the pay? That's a fact. The government boosted unemployment. I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and they're talking about it's hard to get employees to come back to work because unemployment's higher. Well, I'm a Christian. Now, well, I, uh, I mean, I, I know the Bible said that, but I'm getting thousand a week from the government surely God would want me to use wisdom you know I'm only getting 12 bucks an hour at my job which is a third of that I'm getting a thousand a week unemployed but brother the Bible says if you refuse to work you shouldn't eat well I, I know you know what you just said there is no God in that area you didn't mean to say that that's not what you intended to say but that is what you said you said and I said I know God said that, but here's all the reasons why that doesn't apply. Now, when your children do that, what's the outcome? Dad said, don't juggle the knives in the kitchen. What happens when you juggle the knives in the kitchen? You know, you come in crying, you got a knife stuck down in here in your shoulder blade, and blood is gushing out. Now, will your dad help you? Yes. Will you still have pain and stitches? Yes. So, what we have to understand, we're not talking about the grace of God and God turning his grace off. God loves you the same. Whether you obey or don't obey. God loves you the same whether you follow his word or don't follow his word. But Jesus said unless you change how you think. You're not going to get the benefits of the kingdom. So what we're talking about is not whether God loves you or doesn't love you. Whether God's going to take you to heaven. Whether you're the righteousness of God in Christ. We just took communion a few minutes ago. You are righteous in his eyes. If my son juggled knives. I loved him just as much even though he had two of them sticking out of his head. Okay. And I'm going to help him and I'm not going to leave him abandoned. But there are consequences to juggling knives. Remember Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 7. In fact we just listened to this in my car yesterday. In the form of a song. Jesus said those who hear my words and don't act upon them. He said you're like somebody who builds your house what? On the sand. My, kid, my grandkids were in the car last night. And uh, we were playing, there's a salty song. Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. Because it might be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice. Or you'll have to build your house once more. And then the chorus, so build your house upon the rock. Now it's a cute little child song. And yet how many Christians, we build our house upon sand. What is sand? Human reasoning, human thinking, human approaches to things, human logic, human analysis. It's all sand. Jesus said, why do you listen to me? You listen to what I say and then you don't do it. You don't view it as needful. You don't view it as the one thing that's necessary. It's the reason most of us, myself included, don't receive any better than we do. Because we have huge swaths of our life that we live our way. We try and live by God's word. I mean all of us want to live by by stripes you're healed. Don't we? How many of y'all want to live by by stripes I'm healed? The problem is it's really hard to think by stripes I'm healed. When I don't think in line with the rest of his word. Because God's way of thinking 
is up here. And he, he being healed, here's the funny thing, I don't actually believe in healing. And what I mean by that is, I think God's intent was life, zoe, flowing out of you all the time. Healing isn't really what we should need. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're zoe. You know, one of the things, we're chasing the healing when in fact, we're the healed. Uh, this is a revelation if you, if you don't know this. You're not the sick trying to get healed. You're the healed and symptoms have tried to steal from what you what belongs to you. But if you don't think that way, if your thinking is not along the lines of, I am the healed, I am the blessed, let's face it, if you've been battling symptoms for any length of time, what does your mind get con consumed with? The symptoms. And you begin thinking about the symptoms. And you're trying to get yourself healed. And you're trying to get yourself healed. But what becomes big in your thought life is the symptoms. And what becomes small in your thought life is the Word of God. And you try and pull the Word out. I've done this. We all do this. Oh, by stripes I'm healed. By stripes I'm healed. But my thought life is consumed by the negativity of the symptoms. What he's telling us, he's saying my Word has to come down like Mary. And it has to permeate big word, it has to fill and surround every part of your life. The word of God has to be the final, final decision on everything. Turn over with me to the Gospel of John. John. <coughs> Chapter 8. John 8. We all know these verses. John chapter 8 verse 31. John 8 31. Jesus therefore saying to those Jews who believed in him. If you abide in my word. What's abide mean? What's abide mean? How many of y'all use the word abide this week? Nobody used the word abide. It's where you live. Or it actually is much more than that. It just means stay and hang out. You know, in, in uh, Victorian England, they might have, if you were over for tea, they might have said, well, would you like to abide a little longer? Well, they didn't mean move in. They just meant abide here in the drawing room and we'll get another cup of tea and some more little biscuits. And to abide just means to hang out. What was Mary doing? Hanging out at his feet, listening to his word. He said, if you abide in my word, if you hang out in my word, then you'll be disciples of mine. That's the beauty of it. I spent the first 20 years of my Christian walk trying to discipline myself to be a Christian. How many of y'all ever tried to discipline yourself to be a Christian? You got to fast. You got to pray. You got to read your Bible. You got to have discipline. got to have discipline. got to have discipline. Man, I failed more times than I want to even begin to admit I failed. I think I've shared this before, but in case somebody didn't hear it, hear it years ago, not when we were pastoring our home church. We, they were believing for something. Then we're going to have 24 hour prayer. So they asked that little sheet up front. And you signed up. And so the mighty man of God. That I am. Listen when I go to sleep at night. Nuclear war would not wake me up. Once I'm asleep. I'm asleep. So the mighty man of discipline. He decides I'm going to sign up for the 4 a.m. time slot. I have to pray for an hour from 4 to 5. Because the goal was to have 24 hour prayer going. I, I guess you're more likely to get your prayers answered if it's in volume. I don't know. But um, so I sign up at 4 o'clock. I'm going to discipline myself. First morning set my alarm. Boing I'm up. Went down the living room. Got on my knees. Big mistake. <laughs> Prayed for 4 minutes. Slept for 56. Went back to bed. Next morning, I'm going to pray walking. I'm going to pray standing up. I'm going to discipline myself. And I'm going to walk and pray. That way I'll stay awake. I'm going to walk and pray. Do you realize you can pretty much zone out while you're walking? That hour went by almost as quick. And I'm like, I, where, where was I? How do you all know you can listen to a sermon and not hear a word that's said? How many of you all know, how many all can, know you can read three chapters of the Bible and have no idea what you just read? Well, I was praying, standing up, walking back and forth in my living room. Now, you know what happened next? I condemned myself. I'm such a failure. I've let God down. And the Lord's going, I, I didn't tell you to sign up at four. If you'd asked me, I'd have told you that's stupid. You can't get up at four. 
You know, I didn't ask the Lord. I'm just going to discipline. I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to discipline myself. He said you don't need to discipline yourself. He said if you hang out in my word, you become disciples. Anybody know where the word discipline and disciple, same root word. He said my word will bring you to discipleship. You can't do it. One thing is needful. One thing is all you need. Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall live by the word of God. He said if you just hang out in my word. My word will turn you into a disciplined one. I have discovered the easiest most victorious times I have. Is after I've listened to about six hours of preaching. I when Carolyn had the tumor years and years and years ago. We were listening to preaching or the New Testament on cassette tape. Tells you how long ago it was. We were listening to preaching or the New Testament on cassette 24-7. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, preaching or the New Testament. Somebody reading it to us. All I can tell you is, man, after a while, our faith was sky high. Our discipline level, sky high. It wasn't hard to pray. It wasn't hard to trust God. It wasn't hard to do anything. The Word of God did it. We're not going to get into it tonight, but Mark chapter 4. The sower sows the word. And he said the word produces of itself. You don't know how. He said the word will do the trick. He said I send my word down like rain. How many of y'all. I'm sure there's going to be one or two in here. But the vast majority of us have no clue. How rain and dirt and a seed. Turn into a plant. You don't have to understand it do you. You don't have to have any idea how it works. All you got to do. <laughs> is put it to work. It just works. That's what he tells us in Mark 4. And, and we'll get to that at some point. He's saying look the word will accomplish what I sent it to do. The problem is most Christian people don't get any word. And when they do get word. They do what Jesus said don't do. They read it. Let's use another one. It's one of my favorites. Bless those who curse you. I was. Uh, somebody came up to Emily. This past week. What are they called Karen's? I heard they're called Karens, the people that rebuke you if you don't have a mask on. So Emily, my, grand, my daughter-in-law who is pregnant, and pregnant enough that you can tell she's pregnant, a woman comes up to her, rebukes her for no mask, and says she hopes she and the baby die. Because she is ex exposing everyone to all this risk. Emily tells us about it, and I'm like, man, I wish I'd have been there. Oh man, I would have unloaded on that woman. I'd have let her have it. I'd have, you know, first you're an idiot. Breathing your own poison in and out, in and out is worse for you. I'm not, this is not a public health message, but listen. Those masks have their own problems. And I, I had run it through my brain. I'm like, I hope somebody says something to me about masks. And all of a sudden the Lord dropped. You ever heard a sermon and you hear part of a sermon? In the back of your head. Now I'm going to back up to another story. And then you're going to hear what I heard in my brain. Because see. If you don't put it in there. Jesus said the spirit will bring to your remembrance. Well you can't remember what you didn't remember. You get it? Got to remember it to be able to remember it. And so years and years ago. Carol and I heard a sermon by Jesse Duplantis. He's a preacher out of Louisiana. And Jesse Duplantis was talking about. He said one time he was going to the airport and he was late and he said his wife and daughter were in the car his daughter was what seven eight years old and she's in the back seat and he said he gets behind two lane road and gets behind a grandma and she's you know a big bun and he said I am running late it's 55 miles an hour double lanes can't pass and she's going 25 Any ever been, anybody ever been there we were just there this week Carol and I so he said, I'm behind. He, man, lady. And he, he said, I'm fuming. I am fuming. He said, all of a sudden, he said, I'm getting angry and angry. He said, the muffler falls off her car. He said, the muffler falls off. He said, I hit it. Boom. And he said, you know that terrible thump, thump, thump sound, which means you got a flat tire. And he said, I start screaming. Woman, if I could catch you. And his daughter goes, I would. And his daughter goes, you tell her Jesus loves her, wouldn't you, daddy? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm going, I'm running through my brain. Let somebody say that to Emily in my presence. I'm going, and I've got all, and I've heard the Holy Spirit. I heard Jesse Duplantis' voice in my brain doing his daughter's voice. You would tell them Jesus loves him, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Not what you would do. Ah. Ah, no. That's what I'm talking about living by the word of God. You can't just live by, by stripes I'm healed, but I'm not going to live by bless those who curse you. I'm going to live by he meets my needs according to his riches and glory, but I'm not going to live by um, trusting him financially, giving. I'm going to live, I want him to bless me, but I'm not going to give. I mean, and those are just simple, little simple examples. Well, do you believe in tithing, Pastor Tom? Tithing is so Old Testament. So you don't believe we should tithe? I believe it all belongs to God. Be glad he lets you keep some. I'm glad he does. But the reality is, he said, you, can, you live in this. He said, it will make you. It will make you. You can't make yourself and I can't make you into anything worth being. See, this is the whole message of the gospel. If you could do it, you wouldn't need a savior. You can't do it. So you need a savior. And he sent the savior. But notice in John, same book, what's the first words he uses to describe the savior? In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then in verse 12, the Word manifested His flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the incarnate Word of God. Jesus said, no words will ever come out of my mouth that the Father didn't tell me to speak them first. And so Jesus, taught John 12, 49 and 50, He said, I'm only saying God's Word. Mary figured this out. Mary, Jesus' mother, figured this out. When Jesus went to the wedding at Cana, he had never done a miracle. No record of any miracles, is there? No miracles. He'd never done one. What does Mary, she said, hey, they're running out, they've run out of wine. Jesus goes, look, how's that my problem? And basically, that's what he says. Now, Mary, his mother, says the most fascinating thing. What does she say? <laughs> Whatever he says, just do it. Why? Because she might not have seen any miracles, but she'd seen the wisdom and the power of the word of God flowing out of him. That wisdom of God. He always knew what to say. He always knew what to do. He always knew the right words to speak. He always knew the right actions to take. And she sensed that. Why did he always know? Because he knew his father's word. And he spoke his father's word. And he lived his father's word. He said, I don't do anything. I don't say anything except what the father told me. Where did the father tell him? Right here. In the same place he's telling me and you. Now let's go back to John verse 32. He said, if you hang out in my word, it will make you a disciple. You don't have to make yourself a disciple. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. So here's the cycle. You hang out in the word of God. What Mary did. When you hang out in the word of God. It turns you into a disciple. You don't have to do it. The word does it. The word turns you into a disciple. And the word begins to reveal truth to you. What truth? The truth that you're healed. The truth that you're blessed. The truth that you can bless. Didn't Jesus say your father in heaven is kind to evil and ungrateful men. Be like him. That's what he's saying. Be like him. And the truth is, if the father can do it, you can do it. If the father can forgive, you can forgive. If the father can bless those who are evil, you can bless those who are evil. That's the truth. Graham Cook talked about this. Probably one of the greatest revelations I ever got. Because it's one of the most misused verses in the Bible. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. And how many Christians over the years have used that as a bat to beat you? Well, you know what? You, you wear too much makeup. But I'm speaking the truth in love, sister. It's in love. I'm speaking the truth in love. How many of y'all ever seen that, experienced that? Somebody hits you with a bat and then caveats it with, but I'm speaking the truth in love. It's meant in love. No, it isn't, you little rat. You're trying to beat me. You're trying to hit me. What's the truth? The truth is, 
A woman with too much makeup, that's a born again woman, has the inner beauty of the Spirit of God inside of her. The truth is she's gorgeous because of the Spirit of God. That's the truth. Isn't it the truth? The person, the Christian that's losing his anger. Well, you got an anger management problem, but I'm just telling you in love. That's not the truth. The truth is you don't have an anger problem. The truth is you have self-control inside of you. That's the truth in love. Imagine how different our church world would be if we thought like God thought. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to come eat with you. That's another way of saying I'm going to, I like you and I'm going to bless you. He spoke truth that transformed Zacchaeus' life. Dead people, what did Jesus call them? Sleeping people. He said, well, they're sleeping. I'll wake them up. He spoke truth. See, the truth is not necessarily, in fact, generally not what you see. The truth is what God said it is. But if we aren't comfortable and familiar with what God said, we won't know the truth to speak it. That's the other thing Jesse Duplantis said, that one of the problems he had, he said, people go, well, you need to cut your hair, you know, you need to get pay, you know, quit wearing those holy jeans, you know. He said, I knew what was wrong with me. He said, nobody ever told me what could be right with me. Well, the truth is, Jesus will set you free. The truth is, Jesus will bless you. The truth is, Jesus will accept you just as you are. Jesus doesn't expect you to cut your hair or quit wearing makeup or, I heard Kenneth Copeland tell the story years ago, Gloria was up there to, uh, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, she received it. She's just so quiet. He said, she'd received it. And she's just up there praying. And a bunch of the guys came and said, well, if she take off that jewelry, then she'd receive. Because how many of y'all know the Bible says, not by the wearing of jewelry. So that means a Christian shouldn't wear jewelry. Well, it also says not by the wearing of clothing. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to interpret it that far. And we, and we try and use this book to beat each other up. But that isn't what this book was for. This book is life-affirming, life, zoe, life-giving. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're zoe. And the whole point of living in the book and living in the word of God is you're ingesting zoe life. You're receiving zoe life. He said, as you're abiding, as you're doing when I'm doing what Mary's doing, Zoe life is going inside of us. You're not going to cuss somebody out after listening to four hours of Graham Cook. You're just not going to do it. I mean, pretty much, Carolyn and, and Bethany and I, just most of the people in my family, exception of Rebecca, most of the people in my family have, have potential to have short fuses. Well, you know what we all know? If you got, if you're, Bethany's, the, she'll tell you right, if she was here, I know it's time to go get my Graham Cook CDs off the shelf. It's time to log on to the website and listen to Graham. Because after about an hour of Graham telling you who you really are in Christ, because that's what Graham is good at. I mean, we've got, some, we've got a couple of one and a half hour prophetic words on the website where Graham just spends an hour and a half prophesying over you. You're the righteousness of God. You're the beloved. You're a child of God. You're free. And you hear that. And you know what it does? Remember what he said. It elevates you. It begins to lift you up. That word of God begins to pull you out of the lower things of life. The word does it. You don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. But the problem is most Christian people don't view this as the most important thing. And it is simply absolute. There's nothing even close number two. It's not like it's the word of God plus something. It's not. This is it. Jesus said, one thing is needful. And in fact, I think the King James, Jesus said, really only one thing is needful. There's really only one thing you need. If you need wisdom, it's in here. Read the book of Proverbs. You know, it's amazing to me how many Christians have never read the book of Proverbs. Martin Garth, after sitting back there, gives a story how he read the book of Proverbs, a chapter every day, and how many, he was giving me a testimony, just how many things God would show him. Just wisdoms in building a house, wisdoms in doing things. 20 years straight you did that. I don't know how many times I've read through the book of Proverbs and I'm like, you know, I've never seen that before. And it's wisdom that jumps out. and It's the ways of God. You know, the Bible says Israel saw God's acts. Moses learned his ways. As we study this word, as we get, let this word, and again, this, get it out. I'm not saying read your Bible 12 hours a day. 
In fact, we'll wrap up with this. I don't know how long I've been going. Um, God told Joshua, which is Yeshua, it's Jesus, a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. He said this word, he said meditate on it day and night. Now how do you meditate on something day and night? People go, well, you can't do that. Well, apparently he thought we could. Well, how do you meditate on the word day and night? Well, it's really simple. When you were young and you were dating, could you meditate on that guy or that girl day and night? Of course you could, couldn't you? I know I could. When I was dating Carolyn, man, I'd be in school. That's, I never really skipped school until I started dating Carolyn. And she got out early. She got out like at noon. Cause she, and, and so a lot of days I'd be sitting in class thinking, man, Carolyn's getting out. She's getting in a Volkswagen. Because she went to Prince George schools and I went to Hopewell schools. And that, that's why there's the difference in intelligence. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd be sitting in class and I'd be thinking about Carolyn. And I don't know how many times, this was back in the good old days where they took roll in the morning and you were counted present for the whole day. They didn't take... And so I already been to home room. They already took roll. And I don't know how many times I snuck. I got to the point where it's a true story. I used to park in the teacher parking lot because it was easier to sneak out. And I'd park in the teacher parking lot. And then I'd, uh, you know, about 12, 12.30, well, Carol's heading home. She worked a couple days a week, but on the days she didn't work, I'd, uh, I'd uh, head on out. Why? Because I was meditating on Carolyn. Day and night, I was thinking about. He's saying, meditate on my word. When you're in a situation... Man, okay, let's think about what God, what did God say about that? Have I read anything? Holy Spirit, you know, what's, that's what it means, meditate. Okay, I don't know how to solve this situation. Holy Spirit, have, you, you know, and it's amazing how many times Bible verses will pop into your mind. A thought will come to you, an answer will come to you. Meditation is not 24-7, all I'm going to think about is the Bible, all I'm going to think about is the Bible. But, and I, and I thought about other things, obviously. You know, if somebody got a new shotgun, I was momentarily distracted while we checked it out. You know, back in those days, you could bring your shotguns to school, you know, as long as you kept them in the trunk. And, you know, so, hey, man, I got a new hunting gun. You know, you go out in the parking lot and check out their new gun. Okay, I momentarily focused on the gun, or better yet, they got a new motorcycle. You know, okay, uh, we're going to go, let me go for a ride on it. But very quickly, where was my meditation back to? Carolyn, she's always in the forefront. Yeah, you can do it. I'll give you a negative example of it. You're behind on your bills and you're being threatened with foreclosure. How many think you could meditate on that day and night? No problem, couldn't you? Easy to meditate. Now, we don't use the word meditate. We have a different word. It starts with a W, worry. That's all worry is. Worry is just meditation in the negative. So, We've all done that. Every one of us have proved to ourselves we have meditated day and night on the negative. What he's telling us is, is he's saying, keep this word in your eyes. Keep the preaching in your car. Preach. I am appalled, and this isn't meant as a rebuke, but I'm appalled how, many, how few people take advantage of our online library, listening library. I can't tell what people are listening to, but I can tell the last time people logged in. And here are people who haven't logged in in months and months and months. Well, we're listening to other stuff. Okay, good, hallelujah. A lot of people aren't though. But the reality is, he's saying, you, if you want to reach this level up here, you're going to have to let my word transform your way of thinking. It's, and it's a process, and it's a permanent and eternal process. Every single day, we should be drawing a little bit closer to the way God thinks. Thinking a little more in line with God, changing how we think. I was all excited to rebuke somebody on my lack of corona mask. Now it's like if somebody runs into me, the Lord bless you. Hallelujah. No. You know, you've taken all my fun away. But that's okay. I'd rather live the way God said to live than to live the way I choose to live because I have proven to be really rotten at running my own life. And when I follow his way, it works out well. And when I follow my way, it doesn't work out so well. And so he says, he says, Martha, Martha, Martha. He said, you're worried about so many things. And it's really only one thing you need. This is the only thing you need. And most of us don't get, we are woefully short on the amount of word of God we get. And you are not going to live in this fear-filled, negative uh, the phrase Karens is all the suburban soccer moms that are terrified of the coronavirus. 
Well, if all you listen to is Corona news, you're going to be terrified. You talk about terrorism, brother and sisters, that's terrorism. They're terrorizing the population. What do we need to do? We need to be saying, you know what, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to listen to Joseph Prince preach on healing. Or I'm going to listen to Keith Moore. Karen, I've been watching Keith Moore again, listening to the blessings of God. And he's talking about spiritual warfare and, and what that really is and making fun of all the things we think it is. And, you know, constantly listening to the Word of God, listening to the preached Word of God, reading your Bible. If you've got your Bible marker, not bondage, just a little aid if you want it. Read a chapter a day if that helps you remember. If it doesn't help you remember, don't do it. There's no, there's no legalism in it. But make up your mind we want to be Mary and not Martha because we want Mary results, not Martha results. I want Mary results. I want, I want to be able to say whatever he says, <laughs> that's what I'm doing because whatever he says is going to turn out well. And you know, I'll, I'll give you one more story made me kind of laugh. Graham Cook was telling the story. There was a woman in his, in his church that had gotten, uh, had cancer. And it's going to show you the goodness of God and the stupidity of us as Christians at the same time. So, he said the woman in the church had gotten cancer and she catches him in the hallway. She goes, well, you're, you're prophetic. You believe in the goodness of God. You know, I, I've got this, this cancer and they told me it's inoperable and I'm going to die in whatever, six weeks. You know, do you have a word for me? And he said, well, you know, I don't know what's going on in your life. He said, why don't you go pray and ask the Lord what it is he wants to be for you right now that you need a revelation of. That he, that he couldn't be for you in the past. What, do you, what, do you, what, is he, what is he saying to you? Go pray. Now, about, so this lady starts praying that. And she comes back to him a week later. What did the Lord say? Nothing. I didn't hear a word. Week after that, what did the Lord say? Nothing. I didn't hear a word. Week after that, what did the Lord say? Nothing. I didn't hear a word. Fourth week, she's in the grocery store. And she runs into an old friend of hers from years gone by. And the friend's there with her little daughter. We'll say seven or eight years old. I don't remember how old she was. Seven or eight year old daughter. And all of a sudden the daughter goes, Mommy, 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 that's her. And the mother says, Stop, you know. I'm talking right now. But mommy, mommy, mommy. And the mother says, darling. And, and the daughter just gets more animated. She goes, that's her. And her mom says, what? And she goes, the dream. Well, make a long story short. Four weeks earlier, at the same time this woman's telling Graham she has terminal cancer. <coughs> this little girl that night has a dream. Seven or eight years old. And in the dream, she's sitting in Jesus' office Jesus is behind his desk and she's sitting, you know, at Jesus' desk, like we do. And uh, he, she said on the, on the Jesus' desk was a photograph of the woman with cancer. You know how you have pictures of your family? And the little girl, she looks and she sees a picture of the woman with the cancer. And so she asked Jesus, who is that? And Jesus said, that's one of my daughters and I need to get a message to her in the dream. And he hands the little girl a note and he says, give her this. So the little girl wakes up that morning and guess what she has in her hand? A note and a picture of a woman. Four weeks later, there's the woman in the grocery store. So she relays the story, has the note in her little dress, pulls it out. You know what the note said? By my stripes, you were healed. Now, that shows me the love and mercy of our Father. How much trouble he'll go to, to get it to us. But what did he get to her? What could she have had four weeks earlier, or six weeks earlier, or eight weeks earlier, or two years earlier? But where does buy a straight? He didn't give her something new. See, a lot of us think if Jesus appeared to us, he'd give us something new. No, he wouldn't. He'd quote scripture to you. And then you'd think, oh, I got some great revelation. Well, he had to do it because you ignored it out of the book, because you didn't value it in the book. Now, the, and a woman received it and got healed. 
So like I said, it's a fascinating story to me because it shows the mercy and goodness of our God and the stupidity of Christians that we have to have this supernatural experience. I heard a, uh, Kenneth Copeland told a story of a pastor that was just needed of a word from the Lord, fasted 40 days for a word from the Lord. And he said, finally, the Lord gave him a word. Kenneth Copeland said, I couldn't wait. To, in fact, the Lord appeared. He wanted an appearance of an angel or something. He gets an appearance, gets a word of God. Kenneth Copeland said, I couldn't wait. What did God give you? He said, he reads it to him and he goes, it was literally Bible verses. Just Bible verses. That's all you're going to get. Even if you get it, now you think, well, I'll believe more if a little girl gets a dream and hands me a note. No, you won't. Faith is energized by the word. Whether you get it out here or a miraculous delivery by a little girl in a grocery store. We would be well served. It would behoove us had a girl in the church one time go, correct me after service. Pastor Tom, that's not a word. I said, what's not a word? She goes, behoove. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. No, it isn't. There's no way behoove can be a word. I'm like, it would behoove us to go ahead and get it out of here. It would behoove us to just make up our mind. I am building my house on the rock. The solid foundation of what God said. This is how I'm living. This is what I'm believing. This is what I'm saying. This is the word that's going to come down and allow me to repent to metanoia and have my thoughts elevate up to his. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. Lord, we thank you that we can actually get together again. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you're a good father, a good, good father. And that you want us blessed. You want us healed. You want us delivered. You want us prospered. You want us having healthy families and, and good marriages and blessed children and blessed finances. You came, Jesus, you said to give us life, Zoe life abundantly. And we ask you to help us this week and this month and the remainder of this year to have a, a greater appreciation for your word. Help us to become Marys who sit at your feet and receive your word. And let that word transform us. Let that word begin to wash us and clean our way of thinking, Lord, that we are, could be elevated to think like you think. Lord, we ask you to bless the food and the fellowship time. And the folks that aren't here, we just declare no one in the church is getting corona. No one in the church is getting sick. By stripes, we're healed. That everything we do and everywhere we go, we're under the blessing of God. And no sickness and no disease and no quarantine and no fear has any authority in our church in Jesus' name. Amen.